caregivers and those who will need caregivers. Um, and whenever I think about people who are caregiving, I, I think of it as it's just a journey. And um, as an owner of a senior home care company and taking care of a lot of people in the community who need care, I've also been on the personal side of it with my own loved ones needing care, trying to figure out how we navigate through all of that. And in working with one of our, our clients, the daughter stated that, you know, God, I wish there was just like a handbook, like you could just have an instruction manual that tells you exactly what you need to do. Wouldn't that be great just to open it up? By the time I think that that would be great too as a parent of a nine and a 10 year old boy, an instruction manual would come in handy. Um, that in caregiving, there's not an instruction manual, right? Um, a lot of times you just have to take it day by day and whenever I heard this particular daughter talking about how, you know, it would be so much more helpful to have an instruction manual to go by, to have that, that recipe for success, it really made me think of uh, this, this story that involves my own grandmother. And I'm going to talk about my grandmother a lot through this, who, who had dementia in our journey with her. But I, I loved my grandmother. I called her grandmother, very formal name for an informal lady, very country lady. And I spent the summers picking plums and watching her do her jam. And she was famous for doing her homemade pound cake in a bun pan. That was like her thing. So I'm finally old enough to, to say, I want, I want to do this. I want to watch. And just like every great cook, it was, there, was, there wasn't a recipe. It was a dash of this, a little pinch of that, you know, a couple of cups of this. And I watched, and when I came home, uh, I'd asked my mom one day that I wanted to do this. She was like, well, I don't do the pinch and the dash. Here's a Duncan Hines box. Follow the instructions, and you'll be fine. Just follow the instructions. So I was like, okay. So I do my two eggs. I do my four cups of water. I preheat the oven. I got the, the grease out to grease the pan. And I'm getting ready to pour it in and realize I don't know what size of pan I'm using. So I go up to my mom, and I say, I'm almost done. I've been following the instructions perfectly. I just want to make sure this is a 9 by 13 inch pan. She says, well, let me see it because my, my numbers are on the bottom of the pan. So I hand it to her. She says, Shonda, what is on the bottom of this pan? I said, grease. <laughs> she said, why? I said, you said, follow the instructions. And it said, grease the bottom of the pan. <laughs> I like to share that because, you know, here was an example of me not knowing how to work a computer. <laughs> I shared this because this shows you that even if you had the instruction manual, right, yeah. it still might not go according to plan, okay? And so really when you think about caregiving, thank you, when you think about caregiving, it is a dash of, of this and a smidge of that. It might be a dash of patience and some of understanding and some compassion and hopefully some laughter along the way. Um, and you start all that with a pot of some positive communication, you just might be successful. Um, so what I'd like to do is, if I could have everybody at least next to somebody, because you're going to partner for just a second, just sitting next to somebody. So if you're already sitting next to somebody, great. If you're not, if you can move down and just and, and find a, a partner. Okay. <laughs> okay. And so what I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to right now decide who is going to be the caregiver and who's going to be the person with dementia. Make it make a decision of who's going to be who. <laughs> and see this is like a good moment because this is a good moment because in real life you don't get to choose who has dementia, right? Okay, so when my grandmother got dementia, I can't tell you how many times I heard my family say, Why well, couldn't have been daddy? <laughs> yeah, he was the easygoing one, right? So have a seat over here, Amanda. And she's gonna be my, my partner. She she has dementia. So whoever decides to be a caregiver, raise your hand. Raise your hand, caregivers. Okay. Alright, so caregivers, I want you to take your hand, I want you to look at it. I want you to just think about how much you want to be a kind, compassionate, loving caregiver. Think about that, friend. Just look at your hand very lovingly. I mean, you want to help. You want to do so much to help the person, right? Because they, you know they need help, right? You know what's right, okay? Now I want you to take your, care, your caregiving hand, and I want you to look at your 
person with dementia, and I want you to put it in your face. <laughs> and so what does that feel like? Okay? The person who has dementia is a little taken back, right? But what we need to realize in caregiving is that a lot of times this, which is our help, okay? We're trying to give this help. We're being caregivers, right? We love this person. We want to help you. I know what's right. I know you need to get your clothes changed. I know you need to eat this. Okay? But we do this giving, giving, giving. What's the, the problem here, the challenge is, is that the person that we're trying to give the care to, a lot of times doesn't want it. Right? So who are you giving it to? Yourself. <laughs> yeah. And so we get into this push back and forth thing. Before you can even go into care for someone for their ADLs, you have to get an understanding of how you need to have the relationship with that person first. Because that positive relationship is going to get you to be successful in getting them to do those ADLs. Okay? And so if you think about whenever you are trying to give this care and you're, you're, you, you know what's right for them, and you, you keep on at them and you, you say things such as, no, grandmother, remember, you already had lunch. Do you remember? Do you remember? Do you remember? Everybody already came over, they already left. Remember? Remember? Say remember. Remember? Remember, we already, we went to church. We're already back. Remember? Remember? No, grandmother, remember? And then what does it start feeling like? So if you put your hand, put your hand next to the person you're caring for that has dementia. And did you notice the automatic response when there was a push? The other person kind of pushed back. Some of it's automatic, right? And so you keep pushing and you keep pushing, and what ends up happening is you've got this resistance, just building more resistance. So what we're going to talk about tonight is our challenge is not to be caregivers, or to be care partners. That you're going to, you want to partner with the person that you are caring for that has dementia. And you're going to see past this. You're going to see past the dementia. And you're going to see the person. And when you do that, and your approach is different, and you come together in a different way, now I want you to all take your hands palm to palm like this. And try to push. See how it doesn't really work? But this partnership allows this relationship to feel more stable, okay? And in being able to do that, you're walking with them, you're, and you're letting them lead. So you're going on the journey with them, because when we continue to think about whoever it is that has dementia, that it's just a memory problem, it's a memory problem, we're kind of taking away from the devastation of what they're going through. And we need to understand that this is going to be a dance, this is going to be a journey. And they, they need to be able to do the leading, and it's our job to try to match up to where their capabilities are. There's going to be good days and bad days, and that's going to be okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, again, this just talks about, you know, you don't get to choose who has dementia. And as care partners, we're going to try to figure out how we help those that are living with dementia. And it's really critical to remember that they're doing the best that they can. And you're doing your best that you can, too, right? The first step in being a care partner is to self-observe. We have to take a look at ourselves and what we're contributing to the situation. A lot of times the behavior and the reaction that we're going to get from whoever we're taking care of, they're reacting to who? To us, right? Whenever you have somebody that's constantly trying to point out to you what's wrong, because you know they're wrong, right? <laughs> Then they start to be to get, they feel like they are having to defend themselves. And when someone's constantly saying, remember, 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 right? Our challenge is to throw remember out the window and remember that perfect's got to go along with it as well. And with all the mistakes that we're going to make with caregiving, and there's going to be a lot, we're going to talk about different ways that you can keep that relationship intact even whenever you make the person you care for, you're caring for, when you make them angry, when you make them sad, when you make them frustrated. All those emotions might come up. And 
we're going to have ways to be able to make sure that relationship stays intact so you can still stay on your task to get them to do the things that you want them to do. This is my grandmother with my uh, oldest son and my niece. And this was in probably the earlier stages um, when we started, you know, grandmother would just say, I, I have some age memory problems, or that's just my age. And we began seeing different things change with her. And as that happened, you had a lot of family members with a whole bunch of opinions. Nobody, we all couldn't agree what grandmother needed. Um, grandmother didn't think she needed anything. She wanted everybody just to back off. And so our journey began to try to figure out how we can join her in the journey rather than trying to drive her through it. Um, this was, a, when I look at these two pictures in such a short period of time, it shows me sometimes the impact in such a short period of time that it can have. And at this stage, she, um, she needed complete care with all ADLs at this point. And, but we still had really great moments. We, we learned to find the moments to laugh at the situation. And she would giggle too. Um, and so we're going to talk about how we include laughter into being able to care for the ones that we love. So the first, I'm sorry, um, grandmother would get angry quite often, and she would also get pretty teary-eyed and cry, and sometimes not even know why she's crying. And what we had to understand was that she just felt frustrated. So if we were trying to, and, and what she thought was demand, or to, to, for her to, to bathe, for example, she might call us names, or she might cuss, or she would start crying, and then cry harder because she didn't know why she was crying. And in that moment, um, and seeing what my mom and my aunt would try to do, they, they're, they're still on the task. They, they still want her to get that bath, right? <laughs> no, mother, you got, you got to bathe. No, mother, you didn't bathe this morning. Remember, you didn't bathe this morning. Remember? No, I know you did not take the shower this morning. I've been here all day. You have not taken your shower. No, mother, I've already gone into the shower room, and the shower is not wet. And it's, it, it's the cycle. And the more that my mom or my aunt would push this, the more that she would escalate it in whatever emotion that she was experiencing. And so learning to say, I'm sorry I made you feel angry, or I'm sorry I made you feel frustrated, you're able to put that emotion out there because sometimes they might not understand the emotion that they're having. I'm sorry, I was trying to help. This is another one that you can use. And this, is, this can soften it a little bit. Now, there might be times where she'll go, well, you're not that helpful, right? Um, or she'd say, well, I can do without your help, okay? And then we would continue to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I made you feel like you're a child. I'm not a child. That's right. I am not a child. I'm your mother. And I perfectly know what I need. How many of y'all have heard that? And then there's, I'm sorry. I'm trying really hard. Or, I'm sorry, this is hard. Because you're in this together. If it's a truly a partnership, you're in this together. And she's going to have, or he's going to have its bad days, and so are you. And here's the hard one. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're right. I'd rather eat dirt than say this to my husband. Um, but when we are constantly trying to point out to them that they're wrong, okay, we know that doesn't work, right? You want to get things like no and you can out of your vocabulary because they feel like they're being bossed. Also, too, this, when someone has dementia, um, my grandma once sometimes said that she feels dumb. And we had to acknowledge that that's how she was feeling, that this, she was having something taken away from her. And she was angry. And I'd be angry, too. And so when we dismiss talking about the feelings that are there, you're denying yourself to be able to have that connection with the person. Because, again, you're trying to see past the dementia and not be so focused on the task that you're trying to get them to do. 
So our, as I said, our challenge is that we see ourselves as caregivers and not care partners. So to be a caregiver, you need someone to receive. And people with dementia usually don't realize that they have the need to have someone to care for them. So we're gonna create this positive partnership and we're gonna go where they go. We're gonna let them lead in the dance because you're not gonna be able to make them come to you. So before you resist and you correct, because you're gonna use distraction a little bit later, but before you can do that, you have to accept where they are in the world. And once they feel safe and secure again, because what have you done? You've nurtured their what? Their hearts, their feelings. So whatever the task is that you're focused on, it doesn't mean that you're not gonna get it done, you just might not be able to get it done right then. And we have to let go of that because a lot of times that's our view of the perfect scenario. We got church at 12, okay, so we're gonna get up, he's, he's gotta get his meds, gotta get, gotta get in the shower, we gotta get dressed, we're running late, come on, because we're on our task. So when we let some of those things go, we're on their journey, and we're not trying to pull them. So some basics for success. We're gonna become detectives. That's the first key, is that you need to become a detective and not a judge. We're gonna look, and we're gonna listen, and we're gonna use all of our senses. And we're also going to key in to the fact that they're using their senses too. For visual, depending on what stage they're in, they might not be able to understand what you're saying, but they can see the visual. My grandmother not only had dementia, but she also could see out of one eye, she had really bad cataracts on the other. She could barely see anything. And she was also extremely hard of hearing. So we have all of these other challenges besides just the dementia going on. So a lot of times we had to get into her face and speak very slowly and I would, we would motion to her because this means, come on, okay? Or if it is time for a bath, and we're gonna talk about some of those things, you can do a motion to indicate what you want them to start doing. Auditory, what you hear, keep in mind if what they're hearing is, sit down, sit down, stop, no, 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 sit, no, no, we got it, no. They're gonna start building that resistance. This is, well, don't tell me no. Don't tell me what to do. Physical touch is very important. One of the things that I noticed about my grandmother was that she never forgot her ability to hug. And she loved to receive that, that affection that we always gave her. Smell is a very intense emotional response. And through the progression of the disease, keep in mind that they're losing their ability to smell as well as they used to. That was part of grandmother's problem. She didn't think she, she smelled. She, you know, she lost that sense that she had body odor. Other times too, you might have people who will begin eating spoiled food because they simply don't smell that it's bad. Or they might not be aware of like chemical smells. Taste also changes. And so we have to match our help with their remaining capabilities that are left. And we have to let go of the embarrassment. Because a lot of times, whatever is going on, it's, it's really about us. For my mom and my aunt, it was more about them being embarrassed because grandmother wouldn't take a bath. And they didn't want to take her anywhere because they were afraid people would smell her. Grandmother was perfectly happy. <laughs> She didn't care. My aunt and my mom, they started getting embarrassed because we take her places and you never knew what was coming out of grandmother's mouth. <laughs> Who she would have been. So it was really about them letting go of that and just being able to be with her and accepting her for where she is. It's about taking care of the person's feelings, being patient, and understanding there's gonna be unpredictability, and joining the person in the moment. You'll see I have three R's here. 
with the first one being reassure. Because before you try to do anything and get them onto your task, they have to feel safe and they have to feel like you're taking care of their feelings. They want to feel that emotion and that connection with you. And then you can jump into their reality. And that was, that's a hard one. I think when we were in a, a session earlier on and somebody was saying, you know, they saw, they were seeing, had hallucinations, they were seeing somebody. Well, grandmother always saw us babies. But she would name me and my cousin, but she referred to us as us babies. And then here comes my mom. No, mother. Shonda is married, remember? She has two boys, remember? So sometimes we have to jump into their reality. And you can always, if they state something that isn't your reality, you, you state it back. And I think that's what we had talked about. Oh, you see, you see, you see the babies outside? Which ones are out there playing today? And then you can redirect to something that's a little bit more pleasant. And provide them for the opportunities to be successful. That's an important cue. Do is go through just really quickly some of the different stages and some of the things you might have to do to help somebody with ADLs at different stages. So with like mal dementia, you're, they're going to have trouble with word finding and difficulty with abstract thought and repetition, talking on the phone, comprehension of problems, the awareness of difficulties is there. And so the so communication techniques that you're going to be using at that stage is repeating the message stating it again, but using very simple and direct language. We could not tell grandmother, okay, we're gonna go inside and get changed up and then have dinner. What would you like to have, turkey or ham, and go on and on and on. It's way, it's overload. Um, allowing enough time for them to answer. How many times you're waiting for that response and you know you're, you're trying to search the word for them, Oh, you mean, oh, you mean the, the Coke? That's what you want to drink? No, I was wanting to have to drink tea. Tea, you want a tea? <laughs> okay, so sometimes letting them take the time to answer and providing the opportunity for them to express their feelings. With moderate impairment, they're gonna possibly see things. There's gonna be that repetitive action getting lost. They're going to need the reminders at this point for our activities of daily living. There's going to be increased inability to comprehend and carry on a, con a conversation. Difficulty in writing and using objects properly. Losing train of thought. Increased difficulty with comprehension. Substitutes the wrong words because as we know you have your, your vocabulary on the left hand side. We lose on the left, retain on the right. Increase trouble with repetition, avoid social situations, and difficulty initiating a conversation. And this was really the stage where we started seeing grandmother change a lot because she used to be someone who loved to go to church. That was her thing. I mean, she loved her Bible studies. She loved being at church. And she started becoming more and more isolated. But the more I look back on the situation, I think for her it was the embarrassment that she couldn't find the words and she couldn't be in conversation with people. And it was hard for her to have those conversations. And so she became more and more isolated. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, negative impacts that isolation can have. Techniques to use that at this moderate stage is to watch um, the body language of that person. Grandmother would have a hard time coming up with the words that she would want to say, but even if she was mad and she couldn't express it, she would do this. And her nostrils would flare. There was no denying what she was feeling in that moment. The other thing that she would do though when she was feeling sad, she would lower her head and she would, she would just rub it, and then she would do her eyes like this. And we started to, to be able to key in on that's her, she's feeling sad. Slow the heart pace down to communicate, reducing extra noise if possible, speaking at eye level with a person, using touch, 
and getting the person's attention before speaking. My mom would be talking to my grandmother and she'd be walking away like this. And, Did you hear me? Speaking at eye level with a person. I already said that one. Um, okay, so here's, uh, this is our training room actually at Always Best Care. This is where we train our caregivers for a certain segment. And it's about looking at fall prevention. So this is an important topic. We were talking, I was talking earlier to someone about falls and how her husband had a fall. And going back to one of the slides I had about being a detective, it starts with you looking at a space in a room and looking for what things could be red flags. Now this room is a just a mess. It's like full of flags. So let's just talk about some of the things that you want to be aware of though in your own home. You have rugs that are on top of carpet, which could be trip hazards. There's a white electrical cord by the bed. You've got medicines that are open and an organizer at the nightstand. You can't really tell because it's dark, but the phone is away and without a breach. A lamp's on top of some books. Um, there is a urinal canister that actually has, well, it needs to be empty, but it also has it's red tinged, which is not really urine in our training room, it's Skittles that tinge the water. Um, and we're going to talk about urinary tract infections and things to look for that could be smelly or dark colored and, and with urine. Um, if you notice, the sheets are really messed up and this is an issue because this could add to potential pressure ulcers and we're going to talk about that as well. You've got just a lot of clutter in general in the room, things in the way. So these are things that we can modify and change. So when we talk to our carers, we say first thing is, there's gonna be things you can't change and there's things that you can to help you be more successful in your caregiving. This right here are things that you can change. You can modify these things and improve them to be able to have an environment that they can successfully walk through and not have all kinds of hazards in the way. If somebody was to take a fall, these are some questions that would be really important to ask. Number one, you're going to ask, are you okay? The next though, what were you trying to do? Understanding what the activity was at the time, it's going to help you figure out how do you avoid this from happening again? What was different this time when they did it? Was there anything that, a different dynamic that was playing a role? Was the dog in the way this time? Was there a lot of noise going on? What time of day? What position were they found in? This is important. If they were, let's say, five feet away from where their destination was, then it might be more of a balance or a gait issue. Whereas if they're 15 feet away, it might be more of a strength or endurance issue. And these are things that could be addressed with the physical therapist to be able to build their strength up. What was the area like? So again, you go back to my messy bedroom area and you really want to look at the environment Let's say it was the bed. What's the bed height, for example? Is it too low? Is it too high? Is the position of it not where it needs to be in the room? Is this the furniture that's around the bed, is it too cluttered? What were they wearing? Were the clothes too tight? Um, we were talking about falls with shoes. Shoes are an important thing too. Crocs, you do not want Crocs. Those are bad, okay? No Crocs. The other thing too though, is you want your shoes and the floor to have some contrast. Okay, so let's say you have men who have uh, brown shoes, those nice brown shoes, and let's say they have wood floors in the house. You'd want to have some contrast going on there. What assistive devices were being used and where were they placed? My grandmother used her walker to hang laundry. All the time. It was never anywhere near where she was. So you want to make sure that it's placed by them, that they're using it properly, because when she would use it, this is how she would do it. She'd pick it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, again, how far they were from their destination, and were their contents in the, in the commode? When you have somebody who might be experiencing a UTI, 
Some things that you could be looking for would be dark, dark urine, or it has a smell. And if someone does have a UTI and they have dementia, the confusion can actually accelerate. So there was two particular times where we have what grandmother's normal was, and she was outside of her normal. It was accelerated, and it was, it was, we could tell it was just different. Um, however, there was not any dark urine. It did not smell. We, we, we really didn't think anything, there was any type of flag going on. But to be on the safe side, we had her go into the, to the doctor and do her analysis, and sure enough, it was a UTI, and that was on both times. So sometimes you can tell a UTI with behavior before those typical symptoms are presenting. Rest is really important, not just for, for them, but for you too. Um, we need eight hours of uninterrupted sleep for optimal brain functions, and lack of sleep causes irritability, lack of motivation, anxiety, longer reaction times. There's increased errors, poor decision-making, fatigue, and so some of the things that you can do, because we're also talking about someone's husband starting to sleep through the day, um, and we would see that with grandmother too, it was, it was like napping all day long, and then she'd be up all night, getting up to go to the bathroom, getting up to check the door, getting up to check to see if the refrigerator was closed, it was constant. And so what we would do is we would look for things that we could get to stimulate her more through the day, to increase the activity. Even if it was going out to check the mailbox, Ten times. Reducing noise and light for wherever the space that they're sleeping in. I do encourage well at hallways, putting night lights in hallway areas because of course you want them to be able to see if they are getting up in the middle of the night. But if there's too much light in the room, then that could potentially cause them to not want to fall asleep. Reduce the fluid intake. As you're getting closer to night time, when it's time for them to go to bed, be tapering that off and weaning that off. Get their fluids in earlier part of the day. So at night, they're not having to get up and go to the bathroom a lot. And then look at nutrition and drug effects. That could be part of the problem for why they're not sleeping as well. So range of motion. Um, when you look at ADL, range of motion is part of those ADLs. That's what ROM stands for. And it's gonna help improve joint function and these exercises, can, anybody can do these. When we get moved, when you know, we're talking to somebody as a client, they'll say, I, I don't exercise. But these can be done sitting down, these can be done standing up, um, and they're gonna help increase balance and strength. So these are a couple of different um, ROM exercises that can be done. I brought like tons and tons of resources for you guys. After we finish, you can come, take anything you want off this table, and one of the handouts that I have is a handout sheet of range of motion exercises that you can do with whoever you're taking care of because you're going to be more successful if you're doing the exercises with them rather than them handing the sheet and saying, knock out one through ten for me, okay? So range of motion exercises, though, are going to be able to help increase mobility and strength. And again, it adds to you being able to reduce the instance of fault because when you don't use it, when you don't use it, you lose it. All right. So incontinence. First thing to think about with incontinence when accidents start happening is making sure you're on some type of schedule. By doing that, you really are going to help them to be more successful. And being on an every two hour schedule um, is, is a good rule of thumb. Pads and briefs are obviously there to help for accidents. And one thing to keep in mind is to choose your words carefully whenever you're referring to a depends. Using the word diaper, um, can somebody be offensive, um, degrading? Automatic response could be, I'm not a... And so some of the things that you can do is you can call it a brief, but you, you can call it underwear. And it's how you present it sometimes to get someone to feel comfortable with it. So let me show you a little tip. So here's a depends. And what we would do 
is we would fold this completely down. And we would take her regular underwear, and you can do this with any underwear, and you're going to put this over this. And once you do that, this depends, it's kind of disguised at the time. And so if you're actually assisting somebody to give them their underwear, you're presenting it to them with the underwear completely over the depends, like this, okay? There's also some other products that are out there that maybe you aren't aware of. These are called butterflies. Have you all seen these? This is called a butterfly, okay? These are a little tricky to put on, but with some practice you can get it down. But this is for bowel incontinence. And the way that this works is that this middle part is going in between the butt cheeks up against the anus, and then it presses against the skin. And so these are just for this small little accident where you might, and let's say you have somebody that's having a couple of the different little accidents. They're not full blown, but there are accidents. And there's resistance to use, let's say it depends. This can kind of be a starter. For urinary incontinence with women, you can start off with the little small pads, okay? And so these are like assistive things that you can use, but a lot of times if you can get the person to go to the restroom pretty often, then there's not really going to be as many accidents that are going to occur. It's whenever you're going to be loading up your, your loved ones with a whole bunch of fluids in, who forgets to remind them to go to the restroom? Us, the care partners, forget. Okay? Bathing. So the goal is to get clean. It's not to take a bath or take a shower. Whenever I think about with grandmother in this battle, this was probably the worst one. Um, I, I really started to think about what were some of her hangups with this? You know, like what is she, I mean, a lot of times she'd act terrified to even go in there. So I started thinking about the fact that she never swam. She was definitely afraid of water whenever she was a little girl. Remember I told you she can't see hardly at all. She's scared of falling. She had a white tub where you can't really see water in a white tub, right? Um, very cold nature, shivered all the time. So she just didn't want to take her clothes off and shiver some more. So there was a lot of things, she had a lot of good reasons why she didn't want to take a bath. Not to mention the fact that she was completely convinced that she had taken one that morning. Um, and so this was always a challenge and a battle. And once my mom finally got it, it, she does not have to take that full shower. Once she got that, there's other ways that she can get cleaned up. Life became a little easier over at grandmother's house. So there's some things, some more tools. Some of your, if you ever would be in a situation where you're having trouble getting someone to take a bath or to take a shower, and we're going to talk about the actual getting in the tub, but this is where we're talking about a partial bath. So where can you do a partial bath? Well, you can do one in their bedroom. You can do one where they're sitting on the toilet and you're filling up the, the sink. You can do a partial bath at all kinds of places. And the main things that you want to make sure that you're doing in a partial bath is going from clean to dirty, and that you're trying to get them to do as much as they possibly can. This isn't you giving them a bath. This is you encouraging them to be able to do as much for themselves. And so these became our best friends. These washcloths that they could, that grandmother would use, and we would have. You're going to have to do maybe some queuing, and you're going to have to have a lot of them. And then, as far as shampooing, you can get shampoo that comes in a form of like a foam, and it's a rinseless shampoo. Again, this could be your greatest friend if you have somebody who's very resistant of getting in the shower and having a full shower. For grandmother, which worked for a while until we introduced this, was going to, to the beauty parlor. And that really became our outing for us. And it wasn't about getting her hair clean at all. We made it out to be like, I'm going to get my hair done, will you come with me? So you can start off by looking at methods like that, where you're taking someone to the barber shop or to the hair salon. And then whenever that doesn't work any longer, and there's still resistance to actually wash their hair, you can use some of these methods as well. Make sure you have all your supplies ready. Make sure you have the room comfortable. If you're cold, obviously you don't want to take off more clothes, right? 
So one thing that you can do to get somebody more comfortable in a bathroom is you crank the heater up. Who's going to be burning up hot? You. you. Okay. But when somebody gets really, really hot, what do you want to do? You want to start taking off some, some layers because you become hot. So we would get the room extremely hot to where when she would walk in, it was almost automatic that she'd want to take off that big, heavy, she always wore this, like, I guess, like a shower coat or it's like this little sweater coat thing she always had on. It was like her fifth layer that she would, you know, wear. And so as soon as she'd get in the bathroom, at least some layers would start coming off. And you need to be observant while you're giving the bath. Okay, because this is a great time to start looking to see if there is any pressure ulcers that are beginning. The greatest danger in the bathroom is getting in and out of the tub. Okay, what floors? This is where you would want to have a mat down at the tub, right outside the tub. This is a something to think about looking into shower chairs, transfer benches, and grab bars. God bless you. Grab bars are necessary when you have someone who is grabbing at you, the walls, or other objects. And I can always tell somebody would need a grab bar if we're working with them, and they're using the toilet paper holder as their way to lift themselves off the toilet. Or if they're trying to get in the shower and they're grabbing the shower curtain, or they're grabbing you, okay? or the shower rack. If they're going to grab for something, it means they're looking for stability. And this is when you want to introduce some grab bars. And so here's a picture of some grab bars. And I love the, the picture on the left because it shows you, you have a lot of, of areas where they have the stability and stuff to hang on to. And then you have the shower chair as well. And if you know you need a shower chair when somebody is taking a shower or they're getting winded and they're getting tired. You can introduce a shower chair so that way they have a way to sit down. So what does a pressure ulcer look like? Well, for those of you who have never really seen one, be honest. First time I saw one, I thought it was a pimple. And that's kind of what it looks like. But you want to be looking for redness and you want to be looking for warmth. Warm to touch and redness. And they talked a little bit about pressure ulcers in some of the other segments. I don't want to show you all the different stages because for those of you that do get a little queasy, but a pressure ulcer can rapidly go all the way to the bone. And so what we need to do as care partners is to look for ways to avoid it even getting started. And so these are the areas of risk. If someone's laying on their back or even sitting, these are the areas that they could be at risk for. And so these are all those bony areas that we have, okay? And the best way that you can avoid someone beginning to have a pressure ulcer is by changing their position. Change their position constantly. If they're sitting in a wheelchair, you can put pillows behind their back, behind their shoulder blades. You can take a pillow and push it down onto one side to get one butt cheek up and then do it on the other. Even the heels where you see the person in the wheelchair, that can be an area where someone starts getting a pressure ulcer. So you really want to take a look at the skin really well. And usually at that time, or when they're trying to clean up, you're just being observant. Because remember, as care for our partners, we become detectives. So let's talk about safe transfers. And a safe transfer is going to start with your good body mechanics first. So let me look at that first. So what is good body mechanics? Well, first of all, good body mechanics starts with how wide you have your feet. Okay? I'm sure all of you know you don't bend down, right? Like this. You've got to have your back straight. But let's talk a little bit first about like your legs and your knees and what soft knees mean. First, you're going to be shoulder width apart. Okay? And soft knees mean I can jiggle. If your knees are locked, I can't jiggle. Okay? So you want to be able to jiggle a little bit. That's a soft knee. Keeping your back straight when you go down and using the strongest muscles, which is going to be your behind and you're using those thigh muscles to come up and keeping your back straight when you come up. Okay? Anytime you want to do a transfer, 
you've got to also be aware that the other person that you're trying to transfer is going to try to pull on you and grab you in places you do not want to be pulled and grabbed on. Whenever somebody does a transfer, they're, at dan they're in danger for falling, but guess who else is? You. you. Okay? So a safe transfer is when everybody involved doesn't get hurt. You want to make sure that you look at the environment, get all of the unnecessary things out of the way, clutter, things on the floor, and then you're going to look to see what assistive devices are available to you to help you with that transfer. If there's handrails to help you with the transfer, if there's gate belts, and I have a gate belt, and I'm going to show you how that works as well. Okay, so let's look at a transfer. So, the wheelchair that we looked at last week did not have the foot placements on here. This one does, okay? So, I just wanted to show it to you though because if you're doing a transfer, you obviously want these out of the way, okay? So, that's one. The other thing to consider is the placement of the wheelchair matters. I want to say Miranda touched on this, but I wanted to talk about it again. Depending on if the person has a stronger side, you always want to transfer on the strong side. That's the side that you want to place the wheelchair or the chair wherever you're transferring. Okay. The other thing too is if you are if a wheelchair is involved, you always want to make sure that it's locked. Okay, so that would be another step that you would make sure that the wheelchair is locked. Okay, and so this is the chair that I'm going to be transferring her over to. You want to make sure that this is going to be at a 90 degree angle. This is my assistant. <laughs> so, Amy's going to come over here real quick for me. And so, I want to just talk about, first of all, like my body placement and being able to transfer her. Okay? I want her to help me as much as possible. I don't want to be lifting all the weight here. But one only way that's going to happen is about talking to her through the entire transfer. Can you tell me times I've watched somebody getting somebody out of a wheelchair like this? There's, there's no conversation, there's no warning. So you want to be having a conversation with them about what you're doing, asking them what they think they can do, what they're capable of doing, okay? And in the process of making sure that they feel okay. How many of you have gotten up too fast? And you do like the, okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna do a transfer where I'm showing you these are some of the things that you can be thinking about when you are transferring the body. So, get back on this. So, the first thing in a transfer that I always like to do is I, I'm getting down on their level first. Okay? And I'm telling them, look, we're going to get into this chair over here, and I'm hoping that you're going to be able to help me as much as you can. And the first thing that you can do is wiggle to the edge of the chair as much as you can. That's going to help you a lot because it's easier to move something that's closer to your body than it is far away. Okay? You want to be looking at the object that you're moving. You want the object to be close to your body. Okay? And you want that object to be able to be in a position that makes sense for you to move effectively. So, for example, her foot, if her feet are closed up like this, she's all the way back in the wheelchair, I'm going to have a far way to get her to come to me. What I'd like for her to be able to do is to wiggle herself a little bit more into the edge of the wheelchair. So that way she can do nose over toes. Okay? So she wiggles to the edge. Okay? I don't want her to wiggle too much because I don't want her to slide off the wheelchair, right? Okay? And then I'm going to get her to slightly put her feet shoulder width apart. Okay? So I, that's my good body mechanics, shoulder width apart, but I want her to have the same body mechanics as well. I want to move with her and pivot and not twist. So when you're transferring somebody, you don't want to keep your where you're facing this way where you're like where you're twisting your body because this is putting strain on your back. Okay? So the next thing is now that I have her position where I want her to be with her feet, I'm going to get into a squat, okay, to where I can get slightly in between her legs just a little bit. But the next thing is that I want to tell her where she's going to be putting her hands. Because if I don't, where are fingers from this spot she's going to do? Around my neck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
So I want to be able to tell her, look, I want you to put your hands on my shoulders, or she can even do them around my waist. I just don't want her to put her, her hands around my neck, okay? So I'm going to come, but I'm going to put my hands around where her core is. You know those emperor commercials about working your core, okay? So I want her to try to use those muscles, but I'm going to be using my core muscles as well, and I'm going to be wrapping my hands around her waist area. And then I'm going to tell her, we're going to get up on the count of three. All right, so I want you to put your hand on my shoulder. One, two, three. And at this moment, I'm waiting to see if she's okay. If she starts feeling dizzy, do you think it makes sense for me to hurry up and get her in the chair? No. If somebody starts feeling dizzy, or you feel the weight that they're starting to give you their, your, their, give you their weight, you're gonna wanna sit them right back down. At this point, we're gonna pivot which means we're going to go one step, and then as we go down, my back straight, and I go right down back with her, okay? This right here is a gate belt. You can get these at Walgreens. So if you have somebody that is really difficult to transfer, there's a lot of weight for you to pull up on, this can be really helpful. The main thing is to make sure when you use a gate belt that you use it the right way. You don't want it to be too tight, you don't want it to be too loose. So, when you put on the gate belt, what you want is again for it to be at your waist. You don't want it way up here, okay? So you want it to be at the waist. It's gonna go through the loop, and if you're able to put two fingers underneath, snug, okay, but not too tight, then that's, a, that's about where you want it. It's whenever you have the gay belt really loose like this, because what's going to happen when you lift up? It's going to go up. And if it's too tight, it's, it's pretty uncomfortable. Like stuck in, right? Um, and then the way you're going to use the gay belt when somebody has it, you want, come here. Safety things to consider. You can do alert necklaces. 
Um, some of them even have GPS tracking. Yeah. There is um, some uh, other resources to consider, things like Charlie's Place, PACE. PACE is a program of all-inclusive care for the elderly. It's a daycare facility. There's lunch and learn that are offered through Alzheimer Services. I have the lunch and learn schedule down here that you can grab. There's support groups. There's companies that offer caregivers. There's veteran benefits available, such as aid and attendance. There's things like Five Wishes, which is a booklet that talks a little bit about what your wishes are um, when you start to get closer to end of life in La Post. Um, you can learn about assisted livings and what they offer. And I love this quote. This is from Mr. Rogers. <laughs> some days are going to be the, or some days doing the best we can may still fall short of what we would like to be able to do. But life isn't perfect on any front, and doing what we can with what we have is the most we should expect of ourselves or anyone else. Mr. Rogers had all kinds of good quotes, didn't he? <laughs> and so, like I said, I have tons of different uh, handouts and resource stuff that's available here. You, you're welcome to come, mull through it, pick out anything that you like. I'm also going to hang out here, so if somebody wants to practice a transfer, I'm available to do that with you or to answer any questions that you might have about